Okay, good morning. I'm so happy to be here. Thank y'all for having me. Um, Susan is not here today, Susan Curtis. She invited me to speak, and Jan's been great um, hosting. So I thank y'all for having me here. And what a start. Your story was perfect. Um, the meditation was awesome. I feel like we've already done part of our yoga practice, and uh, we just haven't done the movement part yet, the asana, the, the postures, but we've definitely come together, and this is such a spiritual place, just being here. But I thank y'all for that. I do have a short practice planned. I got to make sure I watch this and honor y'all's time. But um, you won't have to wear any leggings, and I won't put you in a pretzel. I promise that is not my purpose for yoga, um, but we might move together towards the end just to finish things up and let you have a little experience if yoga is new to you. I have a feeling that's not the case in this crowd. <laughs> um, but for many of us, the mention of yoga does bring up images of skinny females in leggings and sports bras hanging out on the side of a cliff doing some crazy um, posture that most of us would never think we could even possibly put our bodies into that shape. Um, we also see it as a class full of those people, full of flexible people that um, probably don't really need yoga because they are so flexible already. They arrived like that. Um, they probably need to go do a little strength training and not so much flexing. Their bodies are already flexible. Um, but unfortunately, that's what we see in a lot of our yoga studios and our classes. But it's just a part of yoga. So the asana part, the practice that you see, the postures that you see, they're just a tiny part of it. They're like one eighth of the whole practice. Um, in our culture, it has become the primary part. It's what people seek out. They want to work on stretching to counter another activity that they do. Um, and that's important. Being flexible and being able to move our bodies and get up and down off the floor is very important. But it's just this physical part. And it, at one time, it wasn't for women even, right? So yoga has been around for thousands of years and men practiced it. And the women weren't allowed to practice it. They, they, they might have learned from a husband or their family, but it was primarily done by men. We come to the West and it's primarily women in the studio and the men kind of hide out in the back. Um, my husband, it is a part of our journey. So um, he does through yoga and he was there. It was my way of getting to see him before he was ready to date. So <laughs> we would go to happy hour yoga and then go eat sushi. So. <laughs> um, but thousands of years ago, the yogis explored yoga for the mind and the consciousness. They didn't have science. They didn't have other ways to learn about the body and how the body functioned and worked, but they explored it and they passed it down from a teacher to a student. And typically that student was picked by the teacher to pass this tradition down. It was not written, it was verbal, they learned it and the practices were given to the student. And in exchange, that student might have lived with them. They might have helped on the farm or whatever needed to be done. It was a practice. And, and now we have it available to us everywhere you turn. You could go into a studio and have a live teacher. You could turn on YouTube and have a teacher that will never see you. You just see them. And, and that, that's great too. Or you could go to PBS. Yeah. And it's 50 years of yoga, and that's awesome. So that's great, too, right? So we have this availability of it everywhere. But many, many years ago, back, and they're not even really sure when, the um, Patanjali, who is considered the father of yoga, started to write down the yoga sutras. So what is this practice of yoga, and what is it about? And they're not even sure if he was a person, one single person, or if it was a group of people using a one title, 
right? And, but it was some of the first writings. And this is either from about 5,000 BC or 300 AD. So we're going way back, right? And the Yoga Sutras are still the foundation of many types of yoga and meditation practices. So there's many types of yoga out there. Um, for me, Hatha yoga is my training. And so Patanjali is a big part of my training. He is the father of the yoga there. So we follow that. But the yoga and the meditation practices were to help us dive a little deeper into yoga and spirituality. And as we go through, I'll bring back some of these teachings from Patanjali. A common definition for yoga is union. And that union is the mind, the body, and the spirit. And bringing these things together in a practice and a path for higher self. It's a way for us to make this journey to the higher self. And it's through, in here, we'll talk about the eightfold path or the eight limb path as one journey. The others that you might hear about sometimes is like the, the koshas, they're layers, and we're peeling back the onion to get to this higher self or higher power spiritually. And so we have to peel back the physical part and then start to peel back the mental part. And then we just keep diving deeper into ourselves and this connection. And that is through the meditation part of the practice, okay? the sitting still which is really difficult for most of us, is the sitting still part. Uh, one of my teachers that I follow, her quote, is meditation practice has been used for millennium to help humans experience a deeper reality of connection, the nature of unity in all things. And the meditation practice is to hook into the interdependence of all things, all things in nature, all of us, and our higher power. So a little bit about my journey in the yoga world, which I think is somewhat similar to a lot. I started taking yoga as a fitness class. It was to counter the other things in my daily day to day life, like riding a bicycle and running and I needed to stretch and my body hurt. And this was a good practice. Um, I was not there for a spiritual journey. I didn't even really know that was part of the yoga practice when I started it. I really thought it was about stretching and the relaxation part at the end, this like lay down Shavasana thing. Why are we doing this? I have things to do. <laughs> like, um, I got to get back to work. But it's such an important part for us to learn to still our bodies and be able to connect and listen to our bodies. So my next part of my journey was more for healing. I received a diagnosis for autoimmune disease. I needed to change what I was doing in my life. The outdoor heat in Texas is not the friend of autoimmune disease. It's not the friend of a lot of things. It's too hot. <laughs> Plus exercising on top of that in 100 degree weather is not. So I changed. And I went very far into the yoga world into a practice called Kundalini, which if you're familiar with Kundalini is very much into the breath part of the practice, the meditation, the chanting. Um, it's really spiritual. It's very nervous system driven and endocrine system driven. And you think about these people that thousands of years ago started this practice. They didn't even know what those things were, but they knew how to work with them. They, they knew how to work with your nervous system, how to work with the endocrine system that drives everything in your body. We're driven by hormones in the body. And how do we work with that? And what postures can we do to make the stomach feel better or make um, the lungs work better? They, and they did that without, it was their science. They did have Ayurvedic science. So they did have a sister science to that, right? That's the science of life in India, the Ayurvedic science. Um, from there, I kept going through my training. So I did do Kundalini training and then I've done 500 hours of Hatha yoga training and my daily practice has become my teaching and my, what I share on a daily basis. And I love it. And I'm still practicing and I'm still learning the, the spiritual part because it's just every day you're like, Oh, Hey, how about that? 
And there's a lot of times where I forget my yoga on my mat. So um, my husband will remind me occasionally, very kindly, <laughs> maybe I should behave like I'm in yoga class and not um, crazy jumping off the walls <laughs> at home <laughs> and, and requesting for everything in the house to be done. But uh, so sometimes we have to go back to our mats, right? We behave one, time, one way in yoga on the mat and we got to take that outside. That's part of the daily practice. When you learn to use it outside, when you take this part of the practice and you use it when you're not on the mat, when it becomes your spiritual being outside in day-to-day -day life, when you smile and connect to the stranger in HEB because they maybe needed that today and that was your offering, that smile off the mat, the kindness, let the person in in front of you, right? Just anything that comes from being who we would want to be for ourselves and learning about ourselves. But it's also when you have to lay in an MRI machine for 45 minutes and you need something to do and the breath practice comes in, right? The pranayama, this part of the breathing, because what am I going to do while this machine is banging or somebody's drilling on my teeth? You breathe. Just breathe like we did, right? Three big, slow, deep breaths. It'll change a lot of things. Or the kids or grandkids are driving you crazy. Three nice, long, slow breaths. <laughs> Maybe more. Um, but we are a culture of human beings doing. Right? We're not humans being. We're humans doing. And we take pride in this being busy. There's no prize. You're not going anywhere at the end of life with a big trophy for being busy every moment of your day. Um, so sometimes we need to sit and be in our own actions and sit in awareness of ourselves and our physical body. Uh, Psalms 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. And in a busy world, how do you become still? We can turn to our yoga and meditation practice. The stilling of the restless body and our constant thoughts comes from knowing ourselves. And the asana part of the practice, the physical part of the practice, is preparation for stillness. It's a part of our practice to get out all the movement we need to get out of our bodies so we can sit. And then also that we move our bodies so that when we sit, we're more comfortable. Right? A lot of us can't sit cross-legged, easy pose on the floor, but you can sit in a chair. So, um, the Yoga Sutras, which would come back to Patan Patanjali, who wrote the Yoga Sutras, would say in 1.3, then the seer abides in its essence. We sit, right? And we can feel and know. And this allows us our connection. Um, what's my timing? I looked at my clock, but I didn't really pay a lot of attention to it. Uh, there's a little ADD in there too. So um, <laughs> Patanjali gave us the eight limb path. And this is a path we can follow in our yoga practice to help us with our connection to the higher power, to find the spirituality and whatever your higher power might be. So. One of the things when I was looking at the seven principles for UU and the information about being here and in this practice, we're so similar to yoga because everyone is welcome from any religion to any race to any anything. You're welcome to come to a yoga practice, right? You're all welcome. It's a connected part of us. And we started with Two of the limbs are the yama and the niyamas. So the yama and the niyamas are very much like the Ten Commandments. They're the ethical principles of the practice. Non-harming, non-stealing, truthfulness. These sound familiar? Right? So there's the ones that are aligned with how we treat others and then how we treat ourselves. And diving into a deeper um, practice of ourselves. And then, so that's two, right? 
These are ethical principles of our yoga practice. And then the next is the asana. The asana is the movement part, right? So one eighth of it. Pranayama is breath practice. Flow the breath, deepen the breath, do a special breath. There's, there's all kinds of breath practices you can do. We can do bumblebee, which is a favorite, especially for kids, because you just get to hum. Mm, right? It's very vibrational, so it's a nice. So there's a practice of different kinds of breath that also help to prepare the body for the meditation. And then the last four are all about meditation, stilling the mind. Moving further into that stillness, into your meditation practice, and then into samadhi, which is your higher power in this connection. And so if we could have like a beam of light from our heads up to connect to our higher power. So this is yoga. And it's not just showing up and putting leggings on. Um, it's finding this connection. So I'd like to share a little bit of that with y'all. Um, just a little movement, I promise. Nothing strenuous. You can do it right there in your chair. We're just going to practice a little bit. And I'm going to make you use your mind some. So I also like to practice with my practice using neuroscience and brain um, exercise at the same time because we need that. We need to work the brain at the same time. So we're going to do a little brain work. All right, um, coming back to Patanjali and one of the Yoga Sutras 246, asana is a steady, comfortable posture. Okay. So I don't know about you, but putting my leg behind my head does not sound like a steady, comfortable posture. Um, <laughs> it should be a steady, comfortable posture. So you're going to sit forward, if, if that's available for you today in your chair. If you prefer to keep your back against the back, please do. If your feet can be flat, let your feet be flat. Right? If there is any constraints in any part of your body that you don't want to move your arms up, please don't move your arms up. Right? You can just think about moving your arms up. You don't have to move your arms up. If it's comfortable for you, allow your eyes to be softly closed or downcast. Maybe the hands rest on the tops of your thighs or in your lap. And as you take your next inhale, notice the spine get longer. And as you exhale, find some softness in your shoulders. Let them sink down a little bit. If it's available, inhaling through your nose and find some length in your spine. And you exhale, small open mouth and let it go. Soften your shoulders. One more time. And then we'll let go of the breath. Let the body take control. Breathe as you naturally would breathe for a moment. With your hands resting on your legs, on your next inhale, you're gonna peel your right fingers up, leaving the base of the palm of the hand on your leg. Just peel the fingers up, all the fingers, just on that right hand, and exhale it back down. And inhale and peel up those left fingers, base of the palm stays down. Exhale back down. One more time, inhale, right hand. Exhale down. Inhale, left hand. Exhale down. All right, now we're gonna inhale, right hand and left toes. And then exhale and let those go and inhale, left hand and right toes. The heel can stay down. We're just picking them up and you're gonna take that at your own pace. E inhaling, right and left. Exhale, and then left and right. Good. One more on each side. And when you finish that, both hands peel up and both feet. Just bring things back to symmetrical. 
and exhale it back down. One more time. Actually, one more. And then shake out your fingers and shake out your toes and wiggle around your ankles and wiggle around your wrists a little bit. Shake things out, flutter your eyes open and be mindful of your neighbor. You can bring your hands right in front of you here as if it's like you're holding a ball. And so we don't hit the neighbor next to you. Just inhale and reach your fingertips up towards the ceiling. And then bring the palms together and exhale them down right in front of you. Two more, inhale and lift them up. And exhale and bring them down. Inhaling up. Exhale and bring them down right back in front of you. And pause for a moment with the eyes softly downcast or closed. Think with love. Spirituality is the practice of thinking with love. Let your thoughts slip down from your thinking mind and settle into your heart. And you offer yourself kindness, passion, Love. Offering kindness, compassion, and love to those next to you, and to those outside of the building. And then allow your eyes to flutter back open and pause for a moment. And be quiet for just a moment and notice. Before you move, how you feel in your physical body. How your breath feels in this moment. And the mind, where does the mind want to go? And you come back and that connection um, I hope that gives you a little um, journey into yoga and we close with Sanskrit namaste which is the light in me honors the light in you namaste